This is January 28th, 2019. Welcome to Breans at the Gate in our video blog. Welcome to Drs. Wheeler and Heyman. It's good to be with you today. Lots to talk about as always. Let's start with Venezuela, gentlemen. This is of particular interest to you, your economists. I think what we're watching right now seems to be uh, sort of the impact of a long mm -hmm. series of bad economic decisions. Does that sound right, Jeff? It does, and it's it's not just economic, of course. There's also the, the geopolitical stakes. Uh, Russia, for instance, has said, hey, we have a strategic interest in Venezuela, basically threatening us not to yeah. go in and, and take them out. Uh, many of our viewers are probably aware that uh, Venezuela, uh, their dictatorship has maintained power over the years because of the Cuban uh, military advisors that are an integral part to their military that keep them uh, towing the line behind the the uh, socialist manifesto yeah. of Cuba and so forth. So it, it's it's a geopolitical as well as an economic. The interesting thing economically is is how they've been able to basically uh, tr trash a very productive economy. And it, th this certainly goes to show that natural resources are yeah. not the solution to economic growth, yeah. as they have abundant national resources. But when those are mismanaged uh, through the socialist enterprise, uh, that that's a bad result. So. Yeah, Bert, what do we learn about socialism by looking at Venezuela, do you think? Well, uh, you know, it, it is hard, almost hard socialism, and, and you really have to go back uh, decades, even before Chavez, they were not managed well prior mm -hmm. to his, his arrival, and he almost seemed to stumble upon socialism uh, to try to fix mismanagement, but this is a classic case in bad. They did everything wrong. You know, they, he, he nationalized, uh, regulated, controlled prices, you know, did everything. They're corrupt, <laughs> they were very authoritarian. Mm -hmm. you know, from a political uh, economy standpoint, this is the worst of all possible worlds. You know, he destroyed international trade. Their only export at the end is, is, is oil, and when the, you know, the price of oil uh, fell off, it uh, just, you know, it, we see what it did. They were problematic, and he was using oil revenues to buy off his people and to keep them sort of happy. There's no economic development per se or economic destruction really of what they had prior to uh, the 60s and the 70s. Like I say, if you, if you mm -hmm. trace it back is when things started going south. And at that time, they were the most prosperous uh, economy in that region of the world. Wow, the most prosperous in the region of the world. Well, things have changed quite a bit. So when you think of it today, mm -hmm. it seems like from what we hear in polls that uh, a lot of young people have something of an affinity for, for socialism. socialism. Um, how can we use, I guess, the Venezuela example to start to argue against this. I mean, we don't make any bones about it. We're free market, mm -hmm. to free enterprise sorts of people. Our blog stands in that direction. And so mm -hmm. I guess how do we use Venezuela to preach what we see as the economic gospel, so to speak? Well, I mean, it's obvious to point out the obvious yeah. that uh, Venezuela is an, an utter uh, basket case. Uh, we have millions of people fleeing across the, the border. Uh, of course, the, those, and we, I've blogged on it numerous times, I don't know whether either of you have, and, and kind of even our critics on the blog will say, well, look, it's not really, uh, it's not socialism. A, they're not socialist, because people want to deny that label because right. they want to right. uh, attach themselves to that label for their uh, own purposes. But they'll say, hey, look, it was this, the sanctions. The U.S. sanctions have done that. And, and, and there's no doubt the U.S. sanctions increased the pain on, on the, uh, the regime. Yet U.S. sanctions uh, did not have a similar effect in Iran or other, other right. countries that don't go to that level of, of destruction. Likewise, they say, well, it's the oil uh, price collapse. But why is, is, is Venezuela the only oil uh, exporting country that has this problem? Clearly, it's the nationalization of the, the overall resources that they had and the mismanagement thereof that led to this policy. They've, they've had lack of capital investment in, in that for years. They expropriated the, uh, the foreign oil company's uh, assets and surprise when they don't have the investment in the infrastructure that tends to deteriorate over time. And so all of these uh, state control aspects of it have led to their, uh, their economies collapse. And, and we can debate, and, and I, I don't know what the right answer is in terms of when does a nation become socialist? Yeah, I mean, because every right. nation has, has government price controls and some things, I mean, sure. you know, milk, <laughs> interest rates, what, whatever. But, but clearly, the more price control and the more central authority direction of the economy, the worse you're going to be, and they've taken it to the worst. Well, one thing I would say when you talk about what uh, makes up socialism, I would argue that Venezuela was much more socialist than what the proponents of socialism in the United States want. What oh, yeah. the people in the U.S. want really is just a much larger, more active uh, uh, state, uh, moving more along the lines to a, to a welfare state. Yeah. So I would argue uh, that we want to be careful with each individual policy 
and that the policy not become more socialist inclined. And I agree, I don't think there's this magic tipping point that, that one hits. Uh, it's just that you harm your economic prospects the farther the road down to serfdom that you go. Hmm. And uh, you know, we ought to fight every policy <laughs> to make sure that it's as rational and as favorable to human flourishing as it possibly can be. So, Bert, you said you had some rankings there. You said Venezuela is at the mm -hmm. bottom of those. If you look at the rankings, Fraser Institute yeah. uh, rankings for economic freedom, out of 159 countries, they are 159th. Uh, with regulation, they're literally the worst, worst on property rights. Uh, their monetary policy was horrible, complete mm -hmm. nationalization. Right now. Yeah, yeah, they're fully just out of, out of control. So uh, you looked at the basic way a standard economist would look at Venezuela and they were the case on how to not do political economy. And so you're seeing the result of it right now. And you know, it's interesting to see how some of the progressive left uh, has backed off and said, yeah. well, that's not really socialism. Well, no, guys, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's really, you know, authoritarian, totalitarian economic control is where socialism heads. Yeah. That's what Venezuela was. And yes, uh, Chavez maybe was not the best dictator in the world, neither is Maduro, but at the same time, it's uh, the cumulative effect of the policies that's given them wh where, they, where they've landed. Yeah, that's good. Jeff, anything else to add to it? I, I just think it's interesting as, as we go into our own season and where progressives want to go, we saw Elizabeth Warren's proposal to have a wealth seizure yep, of 2% yep. per year. Yep. Yep. So that's starting down that path as well. Uh, <laughs> Unconstitutional seizure. It is yeah, 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 no yeah. question. But I don't think that's a serious... I think she's just throwing a marker down. Oh, yeah, I don't think yeah, she has yeah. any interest in doing it. Right. It's a way to establish her liberal sort of uh, credentials, so to speak, probably. But well, we'll let's see. let's yeah. use that as a jumping yeah, off to sure. the next point you yeah. wanted to raise. So, so yeah. she's going even further left. Does that provide any openings for other candidates? You know, when you look at sort of traditional political economy, mm -hmm. so to speak, it should be when the two parties move farther apart, which they're clearly doing. Mm -hmm. Republicans and Democrats are moving away from each other for a few decades mm -hmm. now. The median voter is sort of, we have this bimodal distribution. Mm -hmm. There's not much in between. But when you look at the polling, there's not, there aren't a lot of voters parked in the middle. It's not like there are millions and millions of dissatisfied voters just sitting there waiting for some great moderate candidate to jump into the race. Uh, as you probably the viewers know, you guys know, um, Howard Schultz is making noise mm -hmm. that he's going to jump in as an independent, uh, former CEO of Starbucks says that the, is you, I'm sure you were pleased to hear, mm -hmm. Jeff, he said the national debt yeah. is his major issue. Yeah. He thinks that it's an irresponsible, unconstitutional amount of debt, yeah, uh, which I think please. most of us would agree with at some level. Yeah. But I don't think that it, there's a, a great market out there for a guy like Howard Schultz. I saw one person comment, I think funnily, he said, Schultz is a political consultant's dream. Doesn't really know political dynamics, has lots of money to spend. Consultants will get him lots of airtime, pay lots of advertising. I'm not sure you're going to see much bang there, frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, Pro, Ross Pro did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Pro got 19%. That's nothing to sneeze at, but. Oh, 19% right now, completely. Yeah. But yeah, uh, what upset, would that do? Upset the cart. Yeah. 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 And it'll be interesting to see who the uh, candidates are from the Republican and Democrat. And then if, if Schultz runs, uh, it'll be interesting to start talking about it then to see what might happen. You see, I think if yeah. he gets 19%, he hurts the Democrats. The Democrats are yeah. petrified That's right. right now. That's exactly right. You think they should be? Uh, I do. Yeah. I do. Why is that? Uh, because I, I think that uh, as a lifelong Democrat, uh, he's going to appeal to some Democrats that do not, especially because the Democratic Party right now is determined to go as far left as possible. And there are a lot, I mean, we saw uh, uh, some of the, the leading Democrats yeah. today yep. uh, talk about that they needed a moderate centrist candidate. But uh, as you talked about earlier, Elizabeth Warren has had to go even farther left yep. to maintain those credentials. That's right. So I, I, I think it does hurt them. They really ought to try. They ought to try a moderate and see what happens instead of ha well, believing that you have to run to the left. Same thing with the Republican. The Republican oh, they did. will move a little bit toward the center. Oh, they did. Here's the progressive story. Mm -hmm. We <laughs> ran Hillary Clinton. We ran a moderate. <laughs> well, see what that got us? As if the corruption <laughs> aspect had nothing to do with it. But that's what right. they thought. Right. Well, also, if you look at the midterms, though, I believe they're, uh, when they ran on more mainstream kind of mm -hmm. ideas is where they did well. That's what I, I would say. And I think same thing for the Republicans as well. They'd be better off someone a little bit, uh, I don't know, not in terms of policy necessarily, mm -hmm. but in, you know, just in terms of being an overall candidate, came off a little bit more gracious and it would be good. Do you think that the, do you think Trump's recent actions have made it more possible he'll get a primary challenger? And Jeff, you and I have talked about this several times. 
Is he op is he cracking the door open right now for a primary challenger because of how badly this whole government shutdown went? I don't think yet for that alone. Right. I hope that there will still be one, but uh, I don't think that particular. But if he continues to have negative uh, kind of feedback, then I, I think there is the possibility of someone. I might certainly my hope. I will say back to you know, hey Perot, that that's when the two candidates. While even then they tried to appear very distant, they were much closer than I, now. I agree. With I that. think there yep. is an opening in the middle, uh, uh, because let me give you an example. So, so if you, if they don't bother to poll me for some strange reason, <laughs> but if they were to call me up and ask uh, what I think of uh, of uh, Donald Trump's job performance, sure. I would probably, on the whole, on a policy perspective, give him um, generally favorable. Yeah. But that has in no way reflects the fact if I have a, a viable alternative, I'm going to vote against him. So I'm not sure the polls necessarily reflect Fair. what the reality is because because right now the polls when you think about Donald Trump the extreme the other thing is Kamala Harris or or right. Elizabeth Warren right. and then I th yeah I kind of can see why I might go this one direction but if there's a good centrist candidate I mean he not only say the national debt he says we need to get our entitlement spending under control yeah. Yeah. and and all these Democrats proposing all these things he says I ask. How are they going to pay for it? So he's asking some very centrist things. I think there will be some attraction. Now, I would never vote for him because he's going to undoubtedly be a, a, a pro-abortion pro candidate. Pro so that's not happening for me. But right. I can see that there would be many people in the middle that could be attracted yeah. to that. Bert, what would attract you to a middle-of-the-road candidate? Anything, anything enough to make you vote for them? Well, what I would like, I and mean, what I don't like about uh, our, our president is what I perceive uh, that I call his, uh, it's just being illiberal. You know, what I would like is an individual that reflects more free market economic policy. You know, that personally, and again, I think that there are only six of us in the entire country that think like that, but I'm one of them. <laughs> now, I want individual freedom. I want people treated with respect and dignity. Yeah. I don't want people globbed into groups and treated like they're uh, you know, some species of horse with a particular color uh, mane. Uh, so that's what I would like, is have someone that, that follows what I consider uh, considered until recently, even though I saw uh, kind of bumps along the way, uh, what I considered Republican uh, ideological uh, stance. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. uh, of course, just not really realizing that the parties weren't really very ideological, period. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. so that's what I would like as someone uh, that just simply reflects that. And I, I, I don't disagree with Professor Heyman that some of uh, our current president's policies have been. Uh, much better than what we would have gotten if, if almost any perceivable Democrat had been elected. Yeah. I mean, in comparison, Hillary Clinton is more moderate. Mm -hmm. She's definitely more moderate than Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, Ocasio-Cortez, but still she's not moderate in the way that we typically define the term. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, real quickly on the government shutdown, yeah. any takeaways we should take away from that? I think the takeaway, as always, if you're going to have these battles, you must win. Yep. And and yep. and if he doesn't, this shows his inability to make the the proper political calculation. I agree. And so yep. so Mr. Trump clearly lost, and uh, and that might be a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I would assert that many of us would say he could benefit with a little humility in how he conducts himself. Maybe this will give him that. Who knows? Bert, what do you think? Well, I think that the we should not have a government shutdown. They, they need to find some other way to fight. This was not a good way to go about I this. Agree. Just to. Yep upset some people, hurt some people, and uh, really have nothing come of it. It shows a light that some of our, uh, we've got too much, the government's too big. Mm -hmm. They've got government doing too much. We need to, I mean, if we can shut down, you know, even call it that when right. obviously it's not, but call it that and still function and have to go a month before disruptions are bad enough to where we back off, right. that there's, some pro there's something problematic there. Yeah, I think I agree. I think the uh, Trump definitely loses in this round of government shutdown. Don't know why he ever went into it to begin with, because he had so little leverage in the argument, I think. Um, doesn't really speak well to his negotiating and his political calculations, I agree with you. Um, what, I, what fascinated me, just from a political scientist perspective, I think if the president has an advantage in this, he can control the bully pulpit and rally the people and try to force pressure through the system. President Trump really did very little of that. He doesn't mm -hmm. seem to have that kind of uh, desire to go out there and rally people directly toward an immediate cause like this. Um, so I think he failed on that front. I think a, a more able politician uh, who had a more conventional view of political power maybe mm -hmm. could have pulled it off. But uh, I'm not sure he's ever popular enough to do it. Mm -hmm. but at least he could have made a better effort of it. Anything else, Dad? Anything else? Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, thank thank you for uh, for joining us and for listening as always. We appreciate it. If you've got questions, uh, leave them in the comments below or send them to Matt and his marvelous Monday mailbag. Thank you.